Oh, yeah. Uh, first, let me repeat my apology for screw up on the relationship. Um, focuses on change in the system. And also on change in the surroundings. Because that's what's out here. Boundary separates the system from the surroundings. Most of thermodynamics, as it's written and thought of, I suspect, focuses mainly on the system, which is given lots of interest. And that's all right. But we can't forget about what's going on in the surroundings if we want to understand what this science is all about. Now, the various types of systems. So, two different focuses on two. That include first one, a uh, closed system. <coughs>
thing that can cross the boundary is energy from the surroundings. Energy can flow from the surroundings or to the surroundings to cross that boundary. Nothing else. So energy. Cross the boundary. You can cross the boundaries. The motor phase change of the system that's inside the boundary. Still in there. Or the phase or the change that takes place in the uh, system can okay. uh, dispense energy to the surroundings. <coughs> so that's simple enough. I don't want there to be any ambiguity about the meaning of these terms. Let's start, let's start using this. So type two is uh, Type 2 is an open system. All right, so our system is still there, surrounding the out there, and we can have energy across the boundary, or we can have matter, and or matter across the boundary. You say, well, that seems like a pretty dumb thing to do. I don't just keep the matter fixed. I want to let it add to it or subtract from it. And generally, <coughs> we think of uh, open systems, which are, are uh, composites of uh, subsystems. They're called phases. So that uh, if, this, if the system has more than one phase in it, then uh, if you look at the subsystem and the phase as a subsystem, as it undergoes a phase change, matter flows out of it to the adjacent phase. And so what that's made sense is if we, we talk about uh, open systems. And then the third is an isolated system. Just uh, the first law of thermodynamics, which I mentioned yesterday, says in its simplicity that the energy of an isolated system is fixed. Well, if no energy can go in or out of it, then it's fixed. I mean, it's been redundant. So, as we get to the study of the, the first law, we revisit that uh, in some detail. Now, the state of a system. Here, 
Did you need times to pull it through? I don't go ahead with it. System. State one. We, we identify the system and uh, the equation. That's a city mode, front A, it's a mode, country, whatever. And we say that it's sort of a gas or it's a solid or it's a liquid or it is a solution that has a certain composition if you specify it. Um, then it goes to uh, the final state. So we're generally looking at changes in state. Um, um, the F1 is the state property for condition state one, and F2 is the value of that property for conditions of F2. Any state property. Then, delta F is just equal to F2 minus F1. And this is perhaps a most useful, one of the useful ideas and concepts in all of our uh, And unfortunately, students have a way of, of not making use of it sometimes and, and digging holes that uh, they sort of get lost in it. But I keep that in mind that the change in the state function is a function only <coughs> of the initial and final states. How it gets there is totally irrelevant. A system don't change state from state one to state two like genie think to your eyes and change. So the properties have to change in some uh, continuous way. We call that a path. The state of the system must proceed by a string of hidden intermediate states between one and two. But what that's what that path is is totally irrelevant as far as state variance is concerned. Remember that same thing that. Uh, so this is regardless of the path of change. How many paths will there be for a change of state? And there's the answer. And it's an infinity. It's not always an infinity. Conceivable ways. Always. Do you mean you have to make them all? Probably not. But you have to be aware that, that there's no more way to uh, spin red. Uh, so the integral of a state variable is equal to delta f, and this implies that uh, the derivative of the state variable is has a property in mathematics called exactness.
some representative state variables include things like mass, um, the volume, the energy, where uh, scientists in their wisdom say you can't use E for energy in thermodynamics, now you've got to use U. I'm taking back what you call it, but we will call it U. If you know connect with the theory, we will E. Uh, and there are others. There's enthalpy, and there's uh, uh, Gibbs free energy, and there's there's uh, Helmholtz free energy, and uh, there are things like uh, or there's also entropy, and there's heat capacities like heat capacity constant pressure and heat capacity constant volume, and you read about those in those notes that I suggested. And the string goes on and on. Now, this string of things I've written out here have a common uh, feature, and that is that they are extensive. So uh, if you double the size of the system, you double all of those properties. Then there are the intensive ones, which are independent of the size of the system. There are such things as the temperature and the pressure and the density, uh, mass density, which is, of course, mass over the volume. Mass and volume are both extensive, so you take the ratio of them and double over them, you don't change the ratio. And, of course, uh, the molar values of any extensive property, like molar energy or the molar enthalpy, the, the molar free energy, et cetera, over entropy. Uh, this one we got a special name for, if you to, and uh, the molar heat capacities. And some we will talk about in a little detail very shortly. Uh, it will be like this, U bar, V bar, this doesn't mean average anymore. I'm doing that type of theory. That means these two are partial or uh, optics. They're all in test. We'll talk about that. <coughs> now, the minimum. substance in one phase, they kind of need two independent state properties. That's all. <coughs> we got, uh, we got a glass of ice water here, and a glass of warm, and a bucket of warm water here. And those are in different states. But if, if we have a glass of water and a bucket of water at the same temperature <coughs> in this room, then the water's in the same state. Okay. You have to name two of its properties. That could be the temperature and the pressure, it could be the, uh, the temperature and the density. Lots of choices, but just two. And then all the others are fixed. Okay. If you have uh, one phase with two compounds in it, then you've got to name three. You've got to name Two as you would for pure substance, and the third one has to do with composition relative numbers of moles, molecules, whatever the compounds are. As the number of compounds goes up, the number you have to specify goes up. So finally, that's the end of that water plate for now. We're all a little, a little science. 
That's all you say about it? Well, unfortunately, no, because there's all a lot of vocabulary that we don't know about. That. And much for what uses that might have. First, I'd like to point out this is the quintessential uh, irreversible. This is the hardest thing you probably have to learn, maybe in all the science. And the easiest. It's a flow of energy. essential to their digging. Heat is a quantity. I didn't say it's a quantity. I said it is a flow of energy. When I tell you that it is no heat, it's like telling you that molecules don't have a side. You say, oh, he's just joshing. Essential irreversible process. Thank you. 
Come please. Verse one. Process. One for which. Oh, the system. And surroundings. Surroundings will put you in the racks. Simultaneously, sorry, too many words here. Simultaneously, we be turn or restore. Your initial states. System is a little thing at the boundary of the surroundings. It, the system has to, to be uh, it, at least <coughs> allow something to traverse the boundary and be isolated. But then that is surroundings. So the system undergoes a change state, some energy flows across the boundary. And it's about one day. Then, by some means, you bring the system back to the initial state. If there's any difference, if the, if the surroundings don't make it back to their initial state, that system was irreversible. That process is irreversible. You bring them back so that there's nothing more than the initial perturbation, then it's irreversible. That's a big, big idea as well. Um, Something at temperature T1, uh, something at temperature T2, which I'm going to say is less than T1, and I'm going to put these at a boundary, and this will be isolated. Nothing cross that boundary. Now, can the system undergo a spontaneous change? Yes. Now, yes. There's thermal communication between them. Then we can have, and I just show them, the differential can be finite amount. It has to be differential at every step along the way. So it should be sufficient. And uh, this, this can occur spontaneous. Now, put the same two blocks in there, P1.
these things are important because if you don't nail them down in your memory as as cornerstones uh, to depend on, then you get really you get lost. Get into the to the sea. Okay. Now here I'm going to put them in a closed system. Same blocks. This can go spontaneously. That was our observation a moment ago. <coughs> now let's see how we can turn that, take that back to some interesting. How can we get back? How can we turn around and make this equal? By applying energy to T2 so that it's greater than T1? Well, by apply energy T2 is greater than T1. Uh, then the heat flows go not, towards. So the same thing if I apply what? If you apply energy to T2 so that it ends up greater than T1, heat flow will go from oh, yeah, T2 I to want, T1. I, want the, I just want to get these back this. I just want to send that heat back. So this was exactly like it was, and that was exactly like it was. Sure, I could. Thought I'd eat it here and get this one hotter, so but I want this one to be the same thing. I'd pop turn it around, run it back. Anyway, do that. Is that the same thing as taking heat away from T1? Hey, pardon? Can you take heat away from T1 to have it go back? Like energy, take energy away from well, T1? Well, we're, we're losing energy as a heat flow from T1 in this spontaneous process. I'm saying, anyway, to, any way to take energy out of this one and put it in that one. And pulling out with the rims. Well, this is a this is a closed system, not an isolated system. And we do that all the time. We do it all the time. What's it like out there right now? On the top and muggy. What's it like up here? Uh, it's plasma. I don't do really that. Just turn off everything and let the world run without any interference. <coughs> it's going to be cool in here and hot out there. It's going to be hot. Mm -hmm. I Call refrigeration. Yeah, it's enormous. This isn't rocket science. Refrigeration. So I got, I got something here, which I'm going to call uh, refrigeration. <coughs> And refrigerators require power, unfortunately. So I run that refrigerator. Refrigerators have a section on them that is relatively low temperature, and another section on them that's relatively high temperature. You can call those a condenser and an evaporator, but that's for a paper based refrigerators. Another kind of refrigerators, LPA refrigerators, so forth. They, they can sustain a temperature difference. Put power, put power in them, and that is used to generate a temperature difference for the temperature for the same. You turn on your air conditioning at your house or your apartment, and the indoors gets cooler, and the outdoors gets warmer. Absolutely. You go out there and feel uh, that that condenses. Give it a little bit of heat coming out. It's hot in the surroundings. So we do that. We do that. Uh, Precise. And so this is the um, cold, and this is the hot side of the refrigerator. Uh, so constantly we can run it, so we draw this differential heat out here and run it so that we pump this differential heat in here. And don't you see, if you did this first one and then turn around and did this one, we restore the system. 
Is that reversible? Yes. The criterion is that for reversibility, the surroundings also had to be area for sale. But what about here in the surroundings? We consume some power. Right? If we can't restore that simultaneously, then that was irreversible. You can't do this. You can't restore that at the same time you've used that. No, you can't. Same with electricity, you can run your air conditioner, and then after you're uh, through, things equalize again. Uh, you can't get that energy from that. Or you can send it back. It's gone. We're going to find out what's there. What happens to it? How that is tied in with the degree of irreversible. irreversible. So the, uh, this change. It's tempting to say, well, heat flow is, is uh, intrinsically irreversible, so a measure of the irreversibility is how much heat flows. You can flow a, a joule of heat, energy, a joule of energy dissipated as a heat flow, then the irreversibility would be a joule. Is that right? The yeah. answer no, that's not right. That's not right. What? Suppose process two. over here. The flow, the differential heat flow from P2 to P3. But then we have uh, I2 is greater than zero. Are those are equally irreversible? Irreversibility step three has got to be the sum of those other two irreversibilities. So they can't all be the same. So the I3 has got to be greater than I1. I1 is uh, I3 is greater than I2. Uh, therefore, I1 is greater than I2. Uh, therefore, the uh, 
reverse totally a heat flow, it's not a function of just uh, dq or x integral. If it were, the sign of all these things. Therefore, the irreversible heat flow from T1 to T2, uh, where T2 is less than T1, must be a function of Y. Well, certainly, if there's no heat flow, it's not going to be any irreversible. So it has to be there. Something else has to be there. Be back to that point else. But other variables will be influenced if you're very good. Here it goes. What variables are that? Mm -hmm. There's a whole page, and they're all written down there. Entropy? All of kind. Of. And the answer is zero mod not going to about that. And the next part of the answer is the first law that we're going to about that. And the next answer is the second law that we're going to about that. So if you can't do that, you would model through. The zero law can compare two objects and declare with certainty, I mean, using the zero law, you can take two objects and compare certainly their temperature of it. That either one is hotter than the other, or the other is hotter than the one, or they're the same temperature. It always gives you the, the right direction of the temperature difference, which is hotter. 
filtered or any value of this. It won't tell you how much fire and how much water. It is our search. But this is the basis of the model. Fire Street, three things at least. Uh, Center, which is the monitor, for some temperature dependent. This is just stands for the prop, it's not density, it's not. Uh, Here we're stating P1, the one on reach crystal temperature first. And we let the uh, thermometer equilibrate with that because that's what will happen. Go to the zero flaw, and uh, that property will be rho at P1. And then here's the other reference temperature, calibration temperature. And our property row at E2. And here's something we want to measure temperature on. <coughs> so this is a T. And you put your thermometer in there and you measure that property. So from that you measure. we can do. Similar 
triangles. property at temperature T, I should put that in here, minus uh, measure property 2, that's it, that's the monitor. What can uh, the monitor be made of? Say anything at all that has a discernible property change of He described it this way, and it really irritates me that I can't demonstrate this because I built Galileo tomorrow. Uh, I built several. I can't do that anymore. I'll tell you one more. So he said, I took a glass bowl of glass work, glass wine was a part at that time. Built a glass bulb of a neck on a tubular neck on it. He said the bulb was about the size of a hen's egg, and it had to extend down for some distance. And I built a bulb like this, we had a glass shop, a teach glass board, uh, but we were good at it, and uh, so I bring my Galileo thermometer in. I put my hand on it. Say, believe it or not, my hand is warmer than this room. Uh, I was warm some years ago, but it's warmer. And then I would take it, let it stand, dip it into uh, a little pool of water. And as it cooled down, it sucked a little slug of water up in the tube. It's a capillary tube. You can imagine that, right? That's not too hard to imagine. Look, so now you've got this, this ball with some air trapped in it. And a little slug of water in the uh, the <coughs> slug of water. It's a very small bore too. Just in there. And what would happen if I um, put my hand on that bowl and just let it warm up? So I would move up. What would happen if I put a pool of water in the tap and cool down it? So again, there's a property. There's a property that responds to temperature effects of the water. Property is the volume of that air, trapped air, right? Because that changes the temperature as the kinetic magnetic theory tells us it should. If you raise the temperature, uh, the pressure is constant, then the volumes will get bigger and it to show up. It's true. But it's history. 
very practical monitor? Not really. Uh, practical, we'll discuss that momentarily. I like to think of, of how terrified the uh, hospital patients had to be back in that day when they saw the nurse coming for those things and not knowing quite where they were going to stick. So, uh, <laughs> so but that's kind of not a very practical monitor. Row of key is the volume of the trap there. Uh, or the position. Very sensitive monitor, incredibly sensitive monitor, but not very practical. And why? Can anybody give me a reason why it's not very practical? not nearly so sensitive as air, but it's more stable. And then, uh, really, moving along, breakneck pace, science, in that century, back in the next century now. Professor, wouldn't the alcohol be further volatile? Yeah, I would. chose for T1, he chose the coldest temperature in the world that he knew about. What would that be? Ice? Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be ice. It would be, you don't do this anymore, but your grandparents probably did. Ask your grandparents how they made ice cream in the old days. Salt. They said they used a, a slush of ice and salt. Cold enough to freeze the ice cream and the churn. So uh, he used uh, a nice salt uh, mixture. That call that temperature to zero to experiment. That's a freezing point. 
How about for his second Santa Fe? Do you know what he chose? <laughs> boiling water? No. It was boiling water. Yeah. It was the temperature of blood in the human body. And he, I think, called it, I, I think he called it 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now they call it 90.6. Okay. So I'll just give you the bad news. that, the temperature of the freezing point goes to 32 degrees Fahrenheit at the boiling point of the water to 212 Fahrenheit. Then in 1742, Celsius Celsius scale, the temperature is uh, equal to zero plus 100 degrees times the property at whatever the temperature is minus uh, the property uh, at the T1 over the property at 100. Based on the Celsius scale, it's called the Kelvin scale, and this is 273.15 uh, plus 100 times the temperature of the property at whatever the temperature is minus the property at 273.15 uh, Kelvin over uh, the property. 373.5 Kelvin minus property 273.5. Uh, so types of thermometers are not working. Well, the gas thermometers were the first ones invented and developed, and they remain to this day to be probably the gold standard of uh, thermometers. Opera ones like the Kinsey stem one, ones like uh, the Bureau of Standards of NIST have, which fill up a room half this size, maybe this size, with some back pumps and something out of. Uh, but do a wonderful thing where rho of T is equal to the pressure of gas at a constant volume or the volume of gas at a constant pressure um, um, ideal gas temperature is absolute We, we choose to be uh, over a lot of time on the scale. We did that, that we were doing it 
period. But it's still dependent on the properties of the marker, which in this case is not even best. And what we really like is a temperature scale and a way to measure temperature that is independent of the properties of anything. That's what St. Law is. <coughs> well, I could mention thermocouples. I have a little story I'll tell about them. I'll look forward to that. Now, how they work, why they work, and how when you drive them backwards, you get help the refrigerators. They're a nice thing. They keep you very cool. And the cooler you plug into your, your cigarette lighter, you're driving down the road. Uh, and they do all sorts of marvelous things. They cool the, uh, the uh, CPUs on your expensive computers. Uh, I use them to do all sorts of marvelous temperature controls and experiments. So the lovely things that I can't 